Welcome, everybody. I believe this is the last session before lunch. Um, so hopefully you're uh, still uh, chipper from the morning. My name is Phil Robb. I work uh, for the Linux Foundation. I actually carry two titles. I'm the VP of Operations for Networking and Orchestration across all the networking projects at the Linux Foundation. And I'm also currently the executive director of the Open Daylight Project. Uh, this panel is on containers and networking, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, I've got some canned questions, of course, uh, but you know, hopefully we actually get a dialogue going and we get a good discussion uh, amongst the group. Uh, we seem to have a pretty good crowd, so I hope we can have a good uh, and lively discussion. I'm going to go ahead and start off by having each of our panelists introduce themselves, tell you where they're from, what their background is uh, relative to containers and networking, uh, as well as give them the opportunity to right off the bat you know, express what they most importantly want to convey in this panel to you as part of their introduction. So I'll go ahead and start uh, right here with Chris to my right. Chris, go ahead and start. You might have Okay, uh, my name is Chris Wright. I work for Red Hat. Um, I I'm from Portland. Don't you know where I'm from? <laughs> and uh, my uh, I I, do, I run the technology office in in Red Hat, and uh, I'm actually on the board of the Open Daylight Project as well. Uh, my focus in, in my group is looking forward uh, and understanding what the networking needs are. So we spend a lot of time looking at networking. There's one thing I think. I'd like you to take away, it's that networking is absolutely fundamental to both the infrastructure that we're building and the modern applications that we're building. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Josh Wood from CoreOS, where I am responsible for documentation. Um, Chris tells me I look like I'm from Portland, but I am in <laughs> fact work out of San Francisco and from Kansas City, Missouri originally but I, I think as a compliment, right? Look like I'm from Portland. Um, uh, clearly at CoreOS, a lot of our concerns in container networking revolve around the modularity uh, and the abstraction of the interface to different network regimes. Um, we want containers to be portable between your own data center and cloud provider environments, and more importantly, between those cloud provider environments, and that's sort of at the heart of the heart and soul of the work we've done around CNI, first in our Rocket Container Engine, um, and now in Kubernetes itself. Uh, what we like to think of as sort of a, a VFS for different networking regimes, something that that allows a lot of different kinds of networks, network policy, uh, network uh, IP address management schemes to be plugged into what we think of as this important orchestration system without requiring that system to internalize a lot of knowledge about those individual kinds of network styles of networking. So uh, in, in my view, and I think in defining some of CoreOS's products and projects, that view towards modularity and the, the, the key point of, of, of good software architecture revolving around interfaces uh, is, is probably the thing I hope I can draw out the most uh, and talk a little bit today. Patrick? Hey. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Chanazon from Docker. Uh, I'm from Paris originally, not from Portland. Uh, but I, I live in San Francisco. Um, uh, so I, I work at Docker. I'm a member of technical staff there. Uh, I represent Docker at the CNCF. Uh, and my first project when I joined Docker two years ago was to help establish a plugin model for networking and storage. Um, in terms of networking, uh, what I'd like you to remember, uh, at Docker, we really try to make uh, complicated things simple. Uh, so trying to make the simple things easy to use uh, and then the difficult things possible. And that's what we're trying to do with our uh, container networking model and the, the plugin system that's behind it. Hi, I'm Swarna Padilla from a company called Avi Networks. I'm not from Portland, I'm not from San Francisco. I'm from South Bay. Um, live in San Jose and work in Santa Clara. Uh, the one thing that at least I hear over and over again from the networking industry is that there are two distinct elements of networking. One is the connectivity part, where we've seen a lot of discussions and movements, where we've pretty much resolved everything. I mean, uh, there's probably an overlay that just works out of the box. Um, the other interesting part, or the most exciting part, is where the 
where it comes to the non-connectivity part that the network infrastructure provides. Could be the service discovery, like IP address management or DNS, um, scalability, uh, security, all these kind of elements that we have to constantly keep in mind. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, all these services, the non-connectivity services kind of form s something called service mesh. And we at Avi Networks, we provide the service mesh for the modern architectures and also for the traditional architectures um, going back to the load balancing kind of things. And like Patrick, I also represent Avi at CNCF, uh, Kubernetes, and the OpenStack communities. Very good. Thank you, Swarna. So Chris, what are the options today with regard to container networking? CNI, CNM, Oven, et cetera? And how did they, how did they come about? Um, and what are they trying to solve? Where are their similarities? And where are their differences? We're not going to make lunch. Um, <laughs> so maybe a little bit of background. And I won't be able to speak as well to CNM. Patrick could definitely speak better to CNM. Um, but in both cases, the goals of CNI and CNM are to create some kind of, uh, call it standardization and pluggability into networking for the container orchestration layer of the, of the system. And OBN being for oven, depending on your, how you pronounce it, being slightly different, which is more of an implementation, uh, so which could then plug in to these plugin interfaces. Uh, CNI came about as you heard from Josh from, from CoreOS, from work they were doing, um, trying to create some standard specifications around the container runtime, which was AppC, and then has later been folded into work we've done in OCI and standardized in part of the OCI uh, uh, runtime specification. And then associated with that, you, a container is not very useful if it's not connected to the network uh, CNI came about. Um, and then similar time frame. Docker was working on lib network, and I again I can't re really represent well the the heritage there. Um, so I'd love to get Patrick to to give us the details. In a different parallel universe is the implementation side, and that's OpenV switch as one example of a virtual switch that sits on the host that's connecting all the different uh, containers together, and OVN being a uh, control plane managing OVS instances, building the logical topologies and connectivity between containers. Uh, from from a Red Hat point of view, we've gotten involved in, in many of these different projects, and currently we've spent time uh, building uh, OVN into Kubernetes through the CNI interface. Uh, and you know, for us, it's about building connectivity between the different services that application developers are building. Uh, and I think what's most important out of all of that, you know, at the beginning I said I, I care a lot about networking is fundamental to modern infrastructure and applications. Um, maybe equally important, because it's so fundamental, networking is not the domain expertise of application developers uh, and even of infrastructure operations teams on the server side. So. Finding the right balance of separation of duty and keeping it really simple for people who need it but don't care about the details is is really critical. Um, and in both of the cases of CNI and CNM, you're, you're seeing an abstraction that's really friendly to the application developer who's trying to connect services together without having to really care a lot about the underlying uh, underlying details. Hopefully, I got some of answer some of your question. I'd love to hear Patrick's view on the... Yeah, the Patrick? CNN. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'd say CNI and CNM don't play at the same level. Uh, uh, CNM is really a container model, uh, or, or it's a container networking model that we created for Docker uh, that involves uh, um, or that creates a specific set of objects that need to be implemented in the actual system. Uh, in that model, there's a, a driver model that corresponds to the plugin. So I'd say the driver object in the CNM model corresponds to the CNI plugins. And actually, these uh, drivers that are implemented in Docker with Lib Network, uh, our team is working to make sure that they could work well as the CNI plugins. So they, they participate into the CNI uh, working group in, um, uh, in Kubernetes. 
Uh, another angle that I wanted to add is this driver model allows operators uh, to really optimize the networking layer, the expertise that uh, network operators have using traditional technologies like uh, Mac VLAN or IP VLAN. Uh, uh, and, uh, but for developers, uh, it presents a very simple interface where they just need to define the network that their container should be on in order to do the partitioning without knowing internally how it's going to be implemented by the operators. So creating that, uh, that separation uh, and abstraction between what the operators need to configure in order for the system to be uh, very efficient and what developers need to define at the high level for the applications to be well separated is really what all these efforts are about. The last thing I wanted to add is uh, there's an, in, uh, an important aspect of networking that uh, uh, our team have been working a lot on uh, recently, which is Windows. So Windows networking is a whole other beast. Uh, and we've been working pretty actively with Microsoft uh, I think in uh, 1706 of our um, uh, of Docker uh, platform that shipped recently, uh, now you can finally have uh, uh, swarm clusters that are uh, multi-OS uh, between Linux and Windows. Josh, Orna, do you want to comment there? Or? I, you know, I actually just had maybe a, a sort of continuing question for you on that, Patrick. I'm like, you were talking about sort of doing ports from from uh, from the drivers to the like uh, CNI plugin model, like uh, what a, what does that port look like in short, and like how, like what are some of the differences between these these two ways of abstracting the the network interface? Yeah, so uh, it, this port means implementing the CNI interfaces uh, uh, in terms of the implementation that are in the lib network drivers. That, that's all I know. I, I'm, not, I'm not coding these drivers right, myself. Okay, so, uh, but Madhu in our team would be a good person to ping about that. Right on. Well, it's, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the fact that such ports would be possible, even conceptually, I think, is, uh, it, you know, tells some of the value of trying to construct these sort of interfaces so that we can you know, kind of trade these parts around a little bit. Yeah, and I, I would add that that's one of the value that uh, the Cloud Native Foundation uh, provides, uh, helping all these projects interoperate uh, between them. Well said. Agreed. I'd like to just add to Chris's point earlier about the services abstraction that needs to happen in the networking. I think more and more we see uh, non-networking, as Chris mentioned, non-networking application developers deploying all these network services. So how do we make it more simple for them to deploy like a service discovery service or an art scaling service, a load balancing service, or a, a DNS resolution kind of service? So how do we make this easier in service meshes? I think that's where the exciting space is. And thanks to Envoy being just announced this morning, um, it's it's an exciting space, and it, it solves an interesting challenge because it's not been addressed in all these, at least in all these years, as a, something that the non-networking developers or the non-networking teams could also handle it themselves. It's more like it enables that self-service so that now the app developers can focus on their real things where they get to deploy or roll out the blue-green updates if they need to do that. It kind of lets them to focus on day two operations rather than kind of pulling them into the uh, mire of the day zero on how to set up my infrastructure, how to set up my network infrastructure. Um, Swarna, so what is the relationship between VMs and containers now and uh, what you see coming in the future? How does greenfield versus brownfield environments affect that relationship? Okay, containers and VMs, I love the argument, <laughs> or I love the relationship. Um, at least from what we see, containers are more um, single application kind of deployment and single purpose kind of deployment. And it's less about the containers versus VMs, and it's more about the containers and VMs that we see at least that's being more and more adopted, increasingly adopted um, in the enterprises. So you can even deploy a container in a VM. So I think, thankfully, at least the audience that we talk to don't look at it as containers versus VMs. There's a different use case in each of those. and app teams can deploy their application or their instance in a container quickly, up, get it up and running, and test it in a quick um, environment and just migrate that to a production kind of an instance. 
uh, where we see in the brownfield versus greenfield kind of deployments is uh, we see a lot more greenfield being deployed on bare metal, but they have a choice to deploy either on bare metal or even public cloud uh, these days. So it probably will become more like a container in a VM in a public cloud because that's the only way you can deploy a container in a public cloud anyway. Um, in brownfield, I see, uh, at least from our deployments that we see, it's more around virtual deployments. Want to add? I just add a perspective. You're too nice. It's a mess. <laughs> You've got it legacy bare metal applications that we all understand, and they're sitting on some VLAN that's been programmed for you know a decade. You've got VMs that are part of this brownfield environment that may or may not be hosting containers that need to talk to the legacy side of the network and then potentially to containers, which may be running on bare metal or in VMs, and you have to make that all work. And it really is complicated, especially when you have different network orchestration components managing the container piece as well as the underlying virtual machine piece. Uh, so it's non-trivial. And so the greenfield environment is really nice because you can simplify the problem domain, but it's not realistic for most enterprises, they have this, this really rich history of stuff that just isn't going to go away anytime soon. So I think it's really, it's really complex. And some of the things that I know we're working on is integration between those layers so that you can have um, maintain the isolation that's critical, but don't do something that's uh, fundamentally lacking in performance like double encapsulation just because you have two different systems that don't know how to talk to each other. So. Well, there's a lot know, to it's, go. It's interesting you use that word double encapsulation because something that's come up in kind of a, a discussion around the edge of this is one of the reasons we might want to put VMs into containers is so that we can then communicate with the container networks that we do have a good understanding of and an orchestration system that we're working, you know, within and and that like sort of drag them into our world. But if 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 that is if anything is double encapsulation, it's got to be that, right? So although. We would point out that the you know the Borg and Omega systems at Google fundamentally schedule all of the VM workloads inside of containers that are that those systems know and understand how to deploy, how to monitor, how to manage the lifecycle of. So I just think that's a little you know sort of it amused me when it came up in conversation. And then the yeah, actually to to rebound of, uh, on that and uh, answer the original question, but what we see in terms of customers' adoption, uh, I, I I think. Uh, um, while VM have been very successful in the past 10 years, they haven't completely replaced bare metal. You still see both. And I think with containers, it will be the same. There will be more workloads moving to containers, but still they will coexist with VMs and with bare metal, um, like creating the mess that you were talking about, Chris. Uh, that said, what, what one of the trends that we're seeing with a lot of our enterprise customers is that they have a lot of these legacy applications sitting in VMs today, they, they don't dare touching uh, because they are well configured. And one of the things that we see them doing is uh, uh, modernizing these traditional applications by containerizing them and then deploying them on an enterprise uh, container platform. Um, so this is only a 40-minute session, so I want to make sure that there's plenty of opportunities for you guys to ask questions. You know, it's, it's always nice to get a set of experts up here with a variety of viewpoints. Any questions from the audience at this point? Okay. I ah, there's one in the back. So how well do you think that container networking technologies are going to address the need for to have segregated networks that would have to performance or regulatory requirements such as in a NFB telco space? It'll be grand. <laughs> yeah. uh, Perfectly. That's how well. Next so question. That, uh, that sounds like Brian. Um, so there's some real challenges. This so uh, how do you even start? Um, there's been a lot of work done to date to enable the kind of workloads that that Brian's describing in virtual machines, and some of those work, uh, some of that work is actually largely unrelated to networking, um, and it's more about the platform being able to support high-performance network applications running inside 
a virtual machine or in this case inside a container. Um, and then connecting that to a, a more physical portion of the network. And that work w w took, you know, I'd say a number of years. We're just starting to see that in the container space. And we'll have a whole set of uh, just kind of architectural discussions and arguments over what's sane and what's not in terms of um, how you first, wh where do you start to break what feels like cloud abstractions when you do something like pin an application to a NUMA node um, and give an application access to multiple devices in the same pod or in the same container essentially uh, and trying to connect it to the physical network. All of those things are either the beginnings of active discussions or discussions that will be pending, uh, but today it, it's, we're not really there. We're, the, the container space is really servicing more uh, enterprise and, and web style workloads. Uh, so there's, there's real work. I believe there's a lot of potential and we just have to find the right path forward because I do think the, the value of containers is well understood from a development process point of view and then from a network application and pro packet processing performance perspective, you eliminate a lot of overhead by working in a container directly coupled to the OS, which could be coupled to, to IO devices um, without having the virtualization overhead in the way. Front. Thank you. So I, I, I no, as I, no, I'm not knowledgeable enough to sit on that table. <laughs> so I really like what Chris said. It's a mess out there, right? And then we knew we know that there are a lot of developers in the VM world, a lot of developers in the container world. And um, in reality, especially in the IT environment, customers have both in bare metal and legacy stuff too. So from your perspective, where are the projects that you think the two communities can collaborate and then really make a good stack for our customers? I know it's a big question. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, um, and, and Patrick certainly already mentioned it by name, and I think we've all kind of uh, hinted at it and, 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 you know, come closer on the edges of it. I mean, it's one of the key things I think we believe that the value of the CNCF is, is in helping to define these things, and I think it's why um, as we sort of uh, prototyped and thought about CNI and kind of built it out for Rocket, we always had in mind moving it farther upstream so that something like that could at least engender a discussion for the other folks that we were trying, you know, that we're all trying to solve really, really similar problems. So I think the CNCF can kind of be the hub of, of discussions and, and, and currently obviously is the owner of, of that CNI standard. And to go back to the, the song I, I used in my introduction, I think when you can describe a development environment as a mess, when it's new enough, when there's so much interest and so many different corporate and development and technical and architectural points of view represented, that's when interfaces and standards for those interfaces become absolutely key. Um, because if we have something modular that lets our applications or a cluster orchestrator connect with, with whatever brilliant new networking scheme that I'm never going to be the person who thinks of, um, that modularity is what gives that new scheme a chance to actually be adopted, to get any uptake, to, to really be something you can work with and use. You know, if, if, if they're all a, a driver interface that you have to master at some low C programming level to be able to employ them at all, then as, you know, we've all sort of in different ways had the, had in, in different words said, you know, a lot of these are not the, the core competency of the application developers who actually want to use these networks. So I think the, the modularity of interfaces is key to empowering the kind of people who have really interesting ideas uh, for what applications ought to do rather than really interesting ideas about how to implement networks. That might be the best way to put it. And I wanted to add that um, along with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF, um, at least I personally would make a request to the Linux Foundation to also think along the same lines where, because Linux Foundation from the open networking, um, the ONAP or I forget the acronyms, but uh, from that initiative or from those projects, they address the, those projects at least set standards and address the traditional networking. And Cloud Native Foundation, the CNCF addresses this from the container, Cloud Native kind of um, 
angle. So I think bringing some kind of standards and bringing that kind of modular interfaces is much more critical now more than ever. Um, so if anyone can help with the Linux Foundation. Uh, just something for all of us as Duly a community noted. to look at. Sorry? Duly noted. <laughs> yes. And I can actually say that in particularly between ONAP and CNCF discussions have begun to occur. Perfect. Then. Actually. Thank you. There is a, a place. So you asked for a project. It's a little hard because that uh, it's kind of um, you quickly get into Emacs versus VI kind of discussions where it's hard to have a, a rational discussion. Um, there are technologies today that exist that allow you to bridge, and they just all use different um, schemes, whether it's gateways or whether it's integrate directly with existing uh, dynamic routing infrastructure. Um, but again, you get this kind of these, these arguments. I think Josh has a great point that if you create well understood interfaces, you can at least choose your own implementation. Um, and maybe that's punting the problem down the road a little bit, but eventually we'll see some best of breed, like best practices emerge in the CNCF. Not, not that we're here to pump, pimp the CNCF, but just so happens there's a, a working group focused on networking. Um, so there's within projects, there's project activity doing development. There's a working group focused on networking, trying to understand um, kind of this isn't really how they would describe themselves. I'll describe it this way. How do we evolve something like CNI? Put it really simple, um, but really understand what are the use cases, what are the what are the challenges that need to be addressed from a cloud native perspective, uh, and as Phil alluded to, there is work underway to bring about closer collaboration across all these different projects that are addressing all sorts of different parts of networking, not just container networking. Um, so I'd say I'm not the best qualified to answer that question. That would be Madhu in our team. Uh, so I, I can connect you to him uh, to, uh, uh, to see what his plans are in this area. Uh, I, I know what they're working on right now is to make sure that the, the plugin that we ship by default in Docker, like MacVLAN, IPVLAN, and Overlay, uh, could work as well uh, as CNI plugins. But here, I think you're talking about the reverse, like using CNI plugins in Docker networks uh, as plugins. So I, I don't know what the plan is for that. Okay. So that's a feedback from the All right. community. <laughs> Very good. That's the most, uh, Oh, Julie noted, thanks. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll ask you for your email address after that so that uh, we can continue on email. You, you bring up an awesome point. Uh, I was talking about it's got to be simple. Um, so you're, you're essentially you're obscuring a lot of the internal implementations. It also has to be debuggable. So you need to have visibility. And maybe that's more on the op side. Maybe there's some part where the uh, at the app dev side you need to see. But the more complex these stacks get, the more difficult it is to do any kind of debugging. And on a, on a Linux server, uh, server administrator understands how to do you know, pings and trace routes and TCP dumps and kind of figure out what's going on. When you've got Mac VLANs and IP VLANs and VXLANs and all this stuff, you, you quickly don't even know what's going on. And so having tools that help you understand the state of the network, give you visibility, uh, you know, draw instrumentation and let you know where when a physical link goes down, what containers are affected, that's really critical. If we, if we don't get that right, we're, we're kind of building something that's just not maintainable.
Well, just to be clear, I, I didn't want to say that they are similar to VMs. It's really just practical reality. There's connectivity requirements. Um, so we should absolutely work towards the simplest model, especially in a, con uh, pardon the pun, but in a contained space. Um, and so, you know, one example is give every container an IP address and IPv6 address and just consider it a simple routing problem. Um, that's great, except you're not going to be connected by default to the rest of your applications that are inside the enterprise or in some cases even to the rest of the internet. So, um, you know, yes, we need to be doing things that are simple and make sense, but we also have to factor in reality and whether it's gateways or, or working through existing integration with existing routing protocols, we, you know, we have to do something that makes sense. I, I know for, as a concrete example, something, something that we spend a lot of time on is uh, building infrastructure with our customers that's virtual machine based, like using OpenStack, and then deploying Kubernetes on top of that. And doing that in a way where they're separate creates a headache for both, all the teams involved. So there's a project in OpenStack that builds a bridge between the two. So you have pluggability at the infrastructure networking layer, and it's exposing that, that network capability into Kubernetes so that you could do something that looks more like VLAN tag networks in a container out to the VMs, which are ultimately VXLAN tagged on the physical network. So it's not quite this complicated mess that you might build otherwise. Any other comments from the panelists on that? Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. So first of all, maybe even just for the question, or the, for the benefit of the room, but at least for my own benefit, what? Can, so the question is, uh, what can sort of uh, a, a group of vendors do to get involved in the discussion about? Right. Okay. Okay. So again, like the the question is, we we have a we've got some really trick hardware for high performance networking. How can I actually get these new systems to allow my applications to take advantage of that hardware? Like, how do we connect kind of the the last couple of inches between some nifty container orchestration system and I have this awesome hardware I bought from Dell last week with these wicked network cards in it? Right. Um, uh, to, to me, that answer probably it lie. You know, like the the proper place to answer that question probably lies in the like what I think of as the layer of orchestration. Like the some something is making scheduling decisions about where containers run. Part of uh, the the knowledge that that orchestration system can look at to make those decisions is the nature and equipment of individual compute nodes that are available in the cluster. Now, I, like. I, for your standard run-of-the-mill stateless application of the of the the new model type that we want to run on this kind of infrastructure, it's a little bit anti-pattern to ask. I want to run only on a place with an SSD disk and a super high-performance GBE network card in it, right? But that sort of tagging is possible even just in the in the the, the basic state of the art of an orchestrator like Kubernetes today. To, to say that this group of applications, based on its manifest, this, this uh, set of, uh, of containers should only be scheduled to machines that, that match some, some hardware requirement that could, be, that could be those kind of cards or a kernel with, with support for the bypass feature in it. Um, so that would be like maybe my general answer on a boots in the ground way of like, how would I do that tomorrow if I were trying to do it? How to advise you to get involved in the discussion of of like what can we do to automate those decisions or yeah, like
Yeah. Well, I, and so it seems like I've been not quite answering your question for about 25 minutes now, and I apologize for that. But I know certainly um, things that, w that, that we hear from our customers, and one of the major things we try to support with the, with the Tectonic product and a lot of the things we do at CoreOS is we have customers who have a continuing bare metal on-premises story for reasons of compliance or regulatory demands or per performance um, that they're going to continue to have. And those customers ask us questions about really similar, if not exactly identical uh, things. So I haven't necessarily heard a question about doing kernel bypass for high performance networking. One thing I get asked about really frequently is we've made a certain amount of investment in uh, machines with these particular GPUs so that we can offload that kind of processing um, uh, uh, to the GPUs. How do we support that with our container workloads? Uh, how can we sort of mark out those machines among their, the other nodes that they're with in a cluster? Th to me, that's a really, really similar kind of question that's going to have an answer that's probably provided out of similar primitives. So it, like it, it's, it's something you know, we're interested in. Like the, you know, that's an interesting thought to me to try to figure out how to, to solve those. So you're spot on. I alluded to it earlier. I don't know if you saw the, the little lightning keynote thing I did. It's optimized workloads. Um, and GPUs is a perfect example. And it's maybe a more accessible example to the uh, cloud native community because you, you, you really draw out this instinctive reaction, which is, that is a bad idea. Don't do that. Um, but the reality is these are, these are application workloads that, that, are, that could benefit from running in this orchestration platform. So the discussions will be orchestration project specific, I expect. Um, and I know specifically in Kubernetes, it's happening in the resource management SIG, where they're focused on scheduling to um, hardware, uh, scheduling constraints that take into account hardware capabilities. Um, and in addition to that, there is uh, something that in internally we call performance sensitive applications, but the work is happening in the resource management SIG, which is looking at NUMA pinning for, could even be HPC workloads, doesn't necessarily have to be um, what Brian was alluding to earlier, which was the network function virtualization kind of workloads. Um, and related to that would be the, what I mentioned earlier is the CNCF working group focused on networking. That's a place where the industry tries to collaborate to figure out what are the networking specific requirements. Um, and in there, uh, or, you know, in the resource management SIG and related networking groups, bypass for offloads is the kind of topic that comes up. And again, you hit this instinctive reaction that like, that's not cloud, that's not cloudy. Um, but you look at public clouds and they already offer, compute is no longer homogenous. They already, I mean, first it was, you get more memory or more CPUs and it's not very interesting, but it's IO devices, it's it, uh, storage side as well as network side. Uh, GPUs, so you see specialization in the large-scale clouds already. So it's clear that we need to support that um, in the container orchestration platforms. Okay. Um, final question, Patrick. So what would you consider the most popular and interesting use case for containers that you've seen to date? And how do you think that might evolve um, over the next year or two? What, uh, what networking tools do you see as the most critical for further adoption of containers, i.e. for network visibility, configuration, lifecycle management, et cetera? Wow, that's a mouthful. So <laughs> let's go. Um, I, I'd say what, what you see the, the most um, uh, the most typical use case that our 
enterprise customers are using containers for uh, is really modernization of traditional apps. That's what I talked about before, where they take existing apps in VMs. Uh, there are some tools that let you generate layers for a container and then uh, generate a Docker file and you can just Dockerize that pretty quickly. Uh, and then they deploy that onto a modern infrastructure. Uh, and then eventually, uh, very often, that's their road to the cloud as well. They start deploying them internally. Um, a use case I've seen recently, they, they keep, for example, the Oracle database on-prem and then they move the workloads to, uh, uh, to uh, AWS or one of the cloud providers. Uh, so we, we've seen that uh, uh, pretty often. And uh, now the most interesting use case, uh, which to me is a different question, and talking about the future, uh, um, in uh, one large company that I won't mention, or I won't mention their name, but I, I, I've seen a large company doing lots of different IoT uh, and industrial internet scenarios, uh, where they're starting to deploy Docker uh, in factory floors, uh, close to sensors, to aggregate all the data, send that to uh, a gateway that then sends that to the cloud to do analytics. Uh, and these people, they're, they're putting Docker in drones, uh, in uh, very small devices that are sent to the field, uh, in uh, jet engines. Uh, so so I, I can see containers being used in lots of different use cases and scenarios uh, for IoT. Uh, where the current tools that we have built for cloud-native workloads uh, don't work. For example, how do you do orchestrations of containers in a system where half of the nodes are not connected to the network most of the time? So that all the raft um, uh, protocol that we're using, both in Kubernetes and in Swarm, just don't work there. Uh, so I think there's lots of development to be done in this area. And then in terms of networking, to go back to the MTA use case, uh, uh, one of the things that I've seen people asking a lot is uh, integration of the, the existing tools like uh, MacVLAN and IPVLAN into container stacks, and that's what we're doing at Docker right now. Very good. Thank you. Um, as I had mentioned at the beginning, uh, 40 minutes was going to go really fast. We've now hit 42, so I want you to uh, help me in thanking the panelists, please. and enjoy your lunch and the rest of the conference. Thank you.